right. Hello, everybody. <coughs> I think we don't, we don't need all the rows at the back, actually. We could just do with one or two rows in the front. Um, um, I proposed this session because I thought it would be useful to talk to folks or talk with folks who are interested in the longer-term economics of clouds. And um, so I, but I only have initial preliminary thoughts to share. And I'm as interested in what you think about this because it will shape how we engage and how we invest um, over the next year or two. Um, I think we're in the middle of the middle of uh, the gold rush, right? Which is a kind of crazy time, and so um, <coughs> I thought I'd start out with a statement about gold rushes and hangovers. Um, nothing feels as terrible as the period right after a time that felt so good, you know. Um, and I've been around a little while and seen this uh, through a number of hype cycles, um, the dot com uh, bubble and various others. And I think we should be sanguine about the fact that right now we are in a time of irrational exuberance um, around OpenStack. And that's good because it engineers a lot of creativity, brings a lot of resources, and it has negative consequences now as well in terms of sort of the fog of disruption you know, on the show floor and in the sessions. Uh, and it may have bad consequences later as well as the as the tide recedes. Um, the way I kind of think about this is, you know, if you, if you look at things, when, you, when you're getting started with a new kind of way of doing things or a new industry, the, the first guy in demands a return, right? He sort of says, well, I'm not going to do this unless I understand how it's going to work. So, so, uh, that's not what I meant to do. So, So if we consider in the cloud industry, you know, Amazon would have felt like they could at least be certain that they were generating a return on capital in the beginning. Uh, and as, as a hit emerges, right, capital becomes really easy to attract. And I think we see that right now. You know, there's, there's lots of signs of venture funding and institutional investments. So capital right now for OpenStack is getting easier and easier to, to, to achieve. But correspondingly, the return that people are demanding is plummeting. You know, I, I see a lot of people saying stuff like, well, you know, we're going to build a cloud and obviously we have to run it at a loss for a while, right? And to me, that's, that's a clear sign that we're somewhere in this, in this drop, right? The, the income expectation is very, very low. People see, see, will say stuff like, oh, it's strategic and we have to be there and so on. Um, and I think that's fine. But we should know that what is going to happen is is that at some point, people will decide there are winners and losers, and there's no point in joining because you're just going to be a loser. And very quickly, the dynamic changes, very, very quickly. Suddenly, capital gets very hard to, 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 to find because everybody says, well, why are you doing this? You know, that game is over. And that can change in two months, three months. Uh, and immediately then, the situation starts to normalize, and uh, income expectations grow again, and in the long run, hopefully, you have a nice, sustainable, you have a nice, sustainable industry for those who've who've survived. Um, that's where I think we are today. I don't think it's peaked yet, but I think we're getting close. And that's when the hangover starts, right? It's when everybody starts saying, "Sure, but we we really need to have a sustainable story here. Otherwise, there's no point in us being in it." Um, now, there are some very large players out there, um, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts of the world, um, who have genuinely profound strategic reasons to be um, growing in scale. They already operate at tremendous scale. Um, and so, you know, for them, it's relatively easy, I think, to stay in the game. Um, um, but I think there's a much larger collection of organizations, and we have to really understand the dynamics that will keep them, uh, keep clouds viable for them. And the, the two kinds of organizations I think about in this regard, one are enterprises who will be operating private clouds, and the other are smaller regional or, or local um, uh, public service providers. 
Um, and I think it's really important. I think this is the forum which will decide whether or not that second category of, of enterprise private clouds and um, uh, smaller regional and national telco type um, service provider type offerings, whether they in fact in the long run have sustainable niches. So the first thing I worry about is cost competitiveness, right? Um, because of the ability of the very large guys to buy at scale. Now we've seen how scale becomes a weapon. Um, uh, famously Apple buying up the entire you know, world supply of a critical component for two years um, you know, is, is a weapon essentially, right? It means that nobody else will ever get to scale because they can only buy from smaller providers who are ramping up and, um, and it's a way of essentially locking new competition out of a market. Um, I, you know, Apple did that famously with, uh, with Flash um, for their iPods and um, it, was, it had a dramatic effect. But if you consider the, the CapEx commitments that Amazon, Google, Microsoft are willing to make, I think there may, be, may well be a risk that that essentially has exactly the same effect, whether it's deliberate or otherwise, um, on, on supplies of critical components that, that drive the underlying costs for smaller players. Right? If you can't get uh, the next generation SSDs, the next generation. I think we're already starting to see signs of that. You know, there are, there are new classes of SSD coming to the market in non-volatile uh, memory, um, which, are, which I see a lot of signs of, of the big players essentially saying, well, we're only going to deliver these to the mega data center operators for a period, right? Three contracts could buy up their full supply and it immediately locks out smaller players. So it's not just cost competitiveness, it's also access to the ingredients of the of, of a successful underlying infrastructure. And I think this is just as important for private clouds as it is for, for service providers. Uh, for the simple reason that, you know, private clouds don't have um, they they face competition from the public clouds, right? If you're if you're an IT guy um, inside a large institution, you are watching workloads move off into the public cloud and that you're in competition with that public cloud. And I think at some level IT guys understand that. Right? That if all of those workloads were to move, that would be, you know, they would, f they would be looking for a job at a public cloud provider. Um, and so this is as important for private clouds as it is obviously for service providers who, who are competing. Um, in this regard, obviously, you know, we, I think quite famously, have taken a very lean approach to the pricing of the, the, s the services that we provide. And it's because of this, right? There's no point in in, in building a model you know, that depends on input costs to service providers and private clouds that will price them out of the game. And so, uh, so we, that's our, just a hard cap on what, what uh, you know, we, the sorts of engagements we will structure. Um, but the other half of that is revenue models, right? So what are the ways in which these service providers uh, and private clouds will um, generate revenue? And you know there are the, there are the obvious um, there are the obvious things to do you know sell VMs sell disks um, and then there are things that I think are further down the pike but worth understanding and exploring and I think it'd be interesting to have an open conversation about what those things might might be um, the obvious thing that an infrastructure as a service provides is capacity. Right, compute capacity, storage capacity, network capacity. Um, but commodities we know, commodities on a global market provided by large institutions with deep pockets, we know that the, that the economics of that are very, very, very brutal, right? It's like airfares, um, the, you know, as soon as you have 10 airlines flying a particular route, um, the economics of that are extremely lean. Um, server capacity, the server industry, itself you know, has very lean margins. We must assume that the cloud market for essentially virtual goods of the same na nature is going to be even leaner. Uh, and you know, all of the price wars between Amazon, Google, and Microsoft support this. Um, but there is something, uh, there is one way to differentiate a commodity like that, which is location. Uh, and this, I think, is one of the strongest assets of the smaller players. Proximity to uh, a particular audience or, partic or a particular 
um, customer. Um, and I see this at multiple levels. For example, telcos. Telcos, I think, envy the Googles, their ability to um, um, operate at huge scale, very flat infrastructures. Um, but I think telcos have an asset that Google envies, which is the fact that they have points of presence in so many places close to customers. So, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, what Google uh, really would like, I think, is, is lower latency access um, and higher visibility access to the full pipe, essentially, which is something that telcos have. Um, and conversely, um, I don't think the, the telcos will ever be able to compete with the mega data center operators at, at scale, simply because they're not structured to do that. Um, but they do have this location story. And location is important for data um, because of regulatory reasons. Um, it's important for latency because many services, and increasingly I think the services that matter are going to be very latency sensitive. The, the faster you can get that movie streaming, the lower, the, you know, the, the faster the response times on the game that somebody's playing, the better your perceived quality of service. Um, and the combination of those two things, regulatory you know, compliance, data protection and all of that, plus uh, network latency, I think are very, very powerful things to think about. And, and meaningful ways in which to be able to charge a premium for the otherwise commodity goods, right? You may not be able to compete on price with Amazon for a VM of a certain capacity, but you, you don't have to if you can say that your VM is much more valuable because it's closer to a particular thing. Um, the earliest example of that that I can think of is advertising. If you can associate a postcode to a click, it's four times more valuable, or it used to be. I think that 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 it's now you know that's commoditized a little bit too, but um, um, certainly location is an extremely valuable thing if you know how to spin that story, tell that story. Um, so if I look at the the strategic questions facing smaller service providers and telcos, um, national, regional players entering the infrastructure market, I think they have this slightly daunting picture, right? Now, if you think that you're selling, they're typically selling to um, a company which is connected to an audience, right? So if you think you're, you're, you, may be, you may be hosting the, the um, web infrastructure of a news organization or a media organization, um, they're your customer, uh, but their customer, their audience, you know, has a footprint out there in the world. And so if you kind of just look at it as global customers, local customers, global audience, regional audience, and you make that map. I think this is what it looks like if you are a national or regional player. Um, if you have a local customer that only has a local audience, I think that's pretty easy. You know, So say you have, for example, uh, a, a, a media organization, all of whose channels and radio services and, and newspaper pages and so on are in a language that's only really spoken in your country and um, uh, you're the dominant brand in your country, well, then that's easy. They'll come to you and they'll believe that you can serve their audience, right? So straightforward. Um, but say you, you're trying to reach, trying to offer services to uh, an international organization that wants to reach your market, right? So it's still all in your language. You are the branded player. You are the, the, the local leading hosting company or infrastructure service provider in that market. The problem is that in, in foreign institution doesn't know that. You have a brand problem. Like, what's the leading provider in Turkmenistan? Right? Hard to know. Right? Maybe someone knows. I don't. Right? And so, of course, um, people in that sort of quadrant will say, well, the best I can do is probably Amazon. They're pretty huge. They're pretty everywhere. Just go there. Right? And uh, Google can tell a pretty good story about being pretty, pretty global. Um, Similarly, you know, if you've got local customers who are trying to reach a world audience, they will often prejudice their local provider <laughs> because they, they just don't believe, you know, they're attracted to the global brands and it gets even harder if you've got global guys trying to reach global guys because they, they, they're, they're very conscious of scale. At that stage, they're buying very much on price, they're buying very much on scale and, uh, and, and it becomes very difficult. But I think those two 
the brand and footprint questions can be addressed. If you look at, if you look at the, the very large players, um, they have incredible footprint around the world, but it is concentrated, right? They'll have N mega data centers. Uh, and if you look at it, a single regional player trying to compete with that, it's a tricky prospect. Um, but if you were to aggregate many of those, then I think you have an, a potentially interesting story. You have an interesting story on scale because potentially that represents uh, substantial scale. And certainly, um, certainly, you know, that would put you into the category of being able to deal direct with the big suppliers, um, whereas being an individual operator might not, might, might force you to deal with a regional player or a local reseller. Um, and from a audience point of view, that looks like a much healthier picture. If I choose you as the infrastructure for my service, I, I could credibly feel that, you know, if I wanted to reach somebody way out in, in, in Turkmenistan there, that you have a region in Turkmenistan. So, so this idea of federation, I think, is very interesting for that important category of players, right? And let me map out the story. Your service provider in this country starts and builds an OpenStack cloud. And uh, they establish a certain amount of competence in the operations of that and ability to reach the local market. So they're now hitting that first quadrant pretty well, right? Local audiences, sorry, local customers talking to local audiences. Um, in order to reach a broader foot footprint though, they then start to federate with a variety of other providers. What does that look like to their customers? An announcement that they now have a region in that other market. And so if you, if you were a customer of e any of these providers, you would start to see that your cloud, your local cloud provider, now has capacity in a long list of markets which is quite attractive, right? You're still talking the same API. You're still using your same credentials. You still have one bill. Um, you have potentially common expectations of service across those regions. Although I have to say, even the major players do have a certain amount of colorful diversity between the characteristics of their um, different regional data centers. Um, and over time then, you get the ability to potentially be a local player reaching um, uh, a global audience through, through this mechanism. And in aggregate, that federated cloud could come to look like something that the global players might choose to engage with um, rather than one of the mega data center operators. So that's the theory. Um, any comments or questions so far? Anybody actively working on these kinds of cross-cloud relationships or thinking about the dynamics of those? Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's keystone level work. That's at, at a technical level, essentially. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit? To, well, I'm going to get to identity pretty much now. So that's perfect. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what, what that work entails and what you're doing? Can you Pass the mic back. Sure. So um, it's actually a whole bunch of players, Red Hat, IBM, uh, Rackspace, and CERN all working together to introduce uh, federated identity across multiple different clouds. There's a demo later today. There's a talk at about 11 as well about how we, how we do it. But it's using standard protocols. So we could go beyond OpenStack, if you would, uh, using SAML approach. Yeah, that's, that's completely up to the trust and between the identity provider and then the remote cloud being the service provider. 
Um, there are certain attributes that are actually passed along according to that trust, such as username. Um, but there's no credentials actually being sent over. The service provider doesn't have the user's password, for example. Thank you. Uh, I, I was telling this is more of a legal issue uh, because if you are the man in the middle, you are responsible for the transaction between the user and the uh, end provider. So it, it transcends the, the technical stuff. But what about data confidentiality? And like what about data confiden confidentiality and protecting um, the uh, least uh, infrastructure provider from being able to access the data of the user uh, whose workload is being shifted around, for instance. That, that's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, again, it's a legal issue. It's not a technical issue. Um, that, that's the main problem. Because this federation thing, I it's wonderful. I'm working actively on, on this for, for uh, several customers. But um, the problems transcend the technology. And that's what we need to think of. Yeah, I think this is not a technical talk. <laughs> that's why we're having this talk. Um, so my sense is that from a customer perspective, it's very, very clear. You will want, obviously, to comply with the um, know your customer requirements of your local provider, the provider with whom you've signed up. But you're not going to want to have to think about now suddenly essentially becoming a customer of another company with all the know your client issues that that, 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 that entails. Um, the reason I think it's important to talk about this now is because if we just let it happen, we'll get a mess. We'll have different opinions, we'll have different approaches. This is an opportunity for industry to essentially have an opinionated stance and say, no, 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 we want to federate and to recognize that it's not going to work very well if essentially every player demands to know everything about every customer. So the contracts between these players essentially need to be opinionated and with a view to success, right? So that there are regulations, right? There's the, the cloud provider, the remote cloud provider will probably be under pressure to be able to account for everything that's running on their cloud. But that as long as their contract back to the other party essentially addresses that, you know, in the event of a law enforcement process, how does that get escalated to the other side and, and is it appropriately backed is the sort of language that we need to be thinking about. If we just stumble into this, it won't work. You know what I mean? We need, as an, we need industry to have, I think, a fairly opinionated view on what will work and then go out and build it and deal with any issues that that, 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 that arise. So I think identity is um, uh, the first issue. Um, I'm not sure if I had, yeah. Um, let's, put, let's put data privacy, data, data security into that. Um, I think if you're a, a remote operator, one of the reasons, uh, sorry, if you're a remote, a foreign customer essentially, one of the reasons to want to put infrastructure and data into a, a place other than, other than latency is compliance with local laws, right? If that country has said any data that you hold about our citizens must be held in country, as some countries are starting to do, that means that you have to find a way to, to put your apps and your databases and so on and so forth in that country. So I think, you know, there's mutual incentive here. The, the customer, the ultimate customer wants to be in your country, but they want that to be a smooth and seamless process, right? They don't suddenly want to become a customer of n different cloud providers. Um, they don't want an engineer placing a workload in a country to trigger a whole bunch of contract processes, is what it really boils down to, right? We need to decouple the engineering deployment type discussion from the contract um, uh, uh, type, type discussion. What about security? What, what, what concerns would people have from a security perspective? Uh, for instance, what might uh, concern me or what I can think of uh, might concern customers is that 
uh, a portion of my data and will probably have to leave the premises of the provider that I trust uh, and enter the infrastructure of a provider that I'm not sure I trust or I don't know how much I can trust him. Uh, and it's going to be visible not to the other customers on that infrastructure, but to the infrastructure provider itself, himself. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. So for instance, if I'm doing any credit card processing, those credit cards are going to go into an infrastructure which I don't know if I can trust. So in that case, there will have to be some strict assurances of a feature set uh, that some parts of my data I'm allowing to go and uh, some other feature sets that I don't want my data to go into, for instance. Yeah, I think it uh, comes down to how to generate this uh, trust. You have to somehow generate this trust. You m might get some kind of PCI compliance for credit card processing or you might have some ISO certification, ISO 9001. So this is, these are things to, to prove and uh, to, to prove your credibility and uh, yeah, you have some kind of uh, quality control in this uh, federated crowd and uh, this is uh, something that uh, yeah, we have to work out then. Yeah, so you have some kind of basic uh, trust uh, to, to, to uh, yeah, ensure I, I some kind of basic trust. So. I think it's also kind of what the role the person has. So, you know, some, some people are buying and some people are usually selling, you know, on the cloud. And so if you're, if you're a seller, then you have a lot of concerns also versus just, just being somebody on there buying. You know, if, I, if you think of other, other places where these problems must have been solved, you know. I know. Where are you from? Where are you from? Uh, Huawei. From Huawei in China. Uh, no, I'm based in Munich. In Munich, in Germany. Brilliant. And you, sir? No, not you, sir. You, sir. <laughs> I'm uh, Latvian. You're Latvian. Okay. Now, what would be fantastic is to think like if you exchanged phone numbers, right, and called one another. Right, what would be happening? What's that? <laughs> Someone would be making money. Um, but think about it. Your cell phone comes from, a, 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 I assume, an operator in Munich, right? A German company. And yours comes from an operator in Latvia. In? Skype. Oh, don't be difficult. <laughs> Between the telco industry, we already have mechanisms for signaling. We already have mechanisms for handover. We already have mechanisms for billing, right? That call gets routed, it gets placed. Go even further, there's two cell phone base stations. Those might not even be, oh, oh, and all of that's through the local operators as well. Um, there's two base stations. Those may not even be owned by the operators that are showing up on your phone, right? And yet everybody's getting paid, right? Law enforcement happens. It's just fine, right? So we've solved this sort of problem in the telco industry before out of necessity. And I don't think there's that much difference between placing a call and placing a thread, right, these days. And if we start to think of it in that way, maybe we can build quite a nice fabric for this kind of um, distributed computing, which is the sort of era that we're, that we're going into. Um, <clears throat> okay, what else? Brand. What are the various... Ah, did you have a... Yeah, just a comment. Uh, does anybody know anything about OpenStack Congress? It's supposed to be talking to you. I heard about it yesterday for the first time. And the only thing is that it's not the best policy to provide policies and services across any collection of cloud services in order to offer governance and compliance with an IT infrastructure. And which was the project called? Congress. Congress. Anybody go to that session? If we go a couple of years back to the grid computing uh, that was initiated at CERN, I stopped following it uh, for a couple of years, but the original idea of the grid computing was to commoditize uh, compute and uh, storage resources 
and to be able to share them between multiple infrastructure providers and tenants. So I know that obviously OpenStack and, and uh, cloud, commercial cloud and open source cloud solutions have taken over most of that public interest from the original grid project. But that's something the original grid project was trying to solve and mostly succeeded, at least as far as I know, in some aspects of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a topic that already came up before, but for some reason, I don't know if, if it's just the technology that didn't take off <coughs> or if there are other issues that the grid project wasn't able to solve. So maybe we can refer to that and uh, see where we can improve upon it. So from a brand point of view, I think the key brands involved uh, in this case are the local brands, right? I think your, 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 your buyers are going to be dealing with their closest entry point to such a federated cloud. And they will effectively assume that that's what, you know, that's what they want. But there's also going to be a brand associated, I think, with the overall story. And for me, this is a little bit like Visa, right? You, you get your visa card from a local institution, but you expect it to work anywhere in the world. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting analogy there, right? And perhaps we can look to those sorts of institutions for um, model templates on how to structure, oh, and they also have trust and data protection type issues. So perhaps we can look to those sorts of institutions for how to, how to structure those relationships. Um, Service definition, how consistent do you think service definitions need to be across those players? And by service definitions, I think we mean instance types, performance levels, um, uh, SLAs. What else might be in that? And how consistent, how important do you think it is that they be consistent across the various participants? Ask you to re-say that. Uh, yeah, we need to unify the service definition first because each uh, service provider will have their own service definition. There is no standard. And in fact, this is a great opportunity to create a standard for service definition. Mm. And what would you include in that service definition? What, do you, what are the attributes that you think are important? Is it straight instance types? Is there more to it than that? No, no, no. Uh, it, it's more strict than that. And it's the correlation between all the attributes for, from the different services. Because, um, for example, uh, just for a simple infrastructure as a service, you can have 120 different attributes to describe, describe that service. And the permutation between all those attributes, it's uh, a huge mess. And if you put on top of that the PaaS and the SaaS and the security and the networking and so on and so forth, it's it, it, it's a complete mess. So mm -hmm. we need to standardize the service definition for. Who's in? Who's who's who's? Is anybody here actually representative of one of these, or, or feels that they would like to be one of the smaller dots on on that picture that I had up there? Yeah, how do you feel about having your services standardized by somebody else? Yeah, it's, it's uh, difficult, so we have to uh, comply with the definition from somebody else, and our infrastructure might not fit to this uh, service definition. And right. this will I mean, the, the tricky thing about cost, that yeah. ease of, of capital access is that everybody who's going out and grabbing that capital is doing it because they say they're going to differentiate, right? I mean, I see this pattern dramatically, right? Well, we should go raise $20 million to build a cloud, and we're going to beat Amazon because we'll be different. But if everyone's different in different ways, and you cannot generate trust with uh, different uh, service levels. Yeah, it's tricky. And you can't generate capital if you can't differentiate. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, y you don't necessarily have to differentiate on the service description level. Like on a basic level, compute resources, um, even if we have a similar definition of uh, CPU counts per VM type, uh, those might be different uh, CPUs there. So it's, it's, uh, if we, if, if we um, agree upon a unit of computing, a uni unit of memory, a unit of storage, uh, it still leaves uh, enough room to differentiate in different ways to potential investors 
like um, efficiency or data locality or latency, uh, even if the unit of measurement is uh, the same everywhere, there still should be enough ways to differentiate. What about the search? So a actually, if, if you federate a lot of clouds, the end user from Portugal, for instance, might want to know what kind of services are in the federated cloud. How does it search for a service if there is no standardized in the service attributes? Yeah, you cannot do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's always a way to translate. Uh, I think you said it best when you said that you can. It's ultimately just compute and storage and and connectivity, not even networking. So uh, I think that there should be a way to translate. And the more you standardize, the more time, uh, you know, you you reach bad compromises and uh, it'll drive consolidation in the industry in the same way that it did with the tacos uh, around 3G. So, I mean, I would be very wary of pushing towards like standardization. Uh, I think there is also another problem. Um, most customers are not even aware of the parameters uh, they, uh, they need to, uh, to know. And uh, it's making it difficult to have uh, some standardization on this because uh, the providers who are really bad on some specific parameters don't want to see them uh, standardized. For example, latency in some uh, VM environment uh, is very, very bad. And uh, very few people talk about this uh, just because they don't know how to solve this, for example. Well said. OK, we can't get stuck on this one. Billing, I'm not going to get stuck on that one either other than to say that no one will be interested unless that's a solved problem. And uh, I think we've got about three minutes left. Solution portfolios. We talked about the other services and the searchability of services. Um, what sorts of solution portfolios do you think will be most compelling for these cloud operators? And is that something that's attractive and useful? Do, do cloud do, do 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 regional operators feel like they would prefer to be leading and differentiating on solution portfolios, or that it's better potentially to have standard portfolios that are accessible everywhere? Um, do you want to just shout? I don't know. If we have time to get a microphone to you, and I'm not sure where the microphone is. Uh, there it is, actually. So yes, it kind of goes back to discoverability of what capabilities in each individual uh, service provider actually has. And I think they'll probably want to differentiate on the portfolios that they offer, saying that they're best for big data workflows or workloads as opposed to web tier workloads. And I, I think that'll be very valuable to the customer. Other thoughts? Somehow, IES has been commoditized, so next generation business model really driven by the PaaS platform. So each service provider provides their own PaaS platform to attract the local developers to create their own marketplace. Smells like teen spirit. Right. I think that's just about everything we have time for. Any other topics that you folks want to touch on? At the back, do you want to shout? Yeah. So do you want, oh, look oh, at that. I have a mic. So uh, what happens uh, if the relationship between uh, big player and small player becomes broken? So if they went out of contract, what, what will happen with customers in that case? That's also something that we need to consider. Unwinding, yeah, that's interesting. Any other topics? Very good. Well, let me thank you very much for um, all of your contributions and ideas. I think this is a very thought-provoking uh, area and, uh, and certainly an area where we um, see a good deal of interest between the, the folks who are raising money uh, and want to have a long-term sustainable view on how that will work. Thank you. Have a great conference.